And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday to you, too. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. All right. Let's jump into our keyword news portion of the day. We're going to try to clarify some major headlines for our listeners. And this is our first pick of the day. Japan Diplomacy. So Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is likely to arrive in Seoul for a two-day trip on Sunday. President Yoon will have another opportunity to mend ties with Tokyo and bolster trilateral cooperation with the U.S. during the G7 summit coming up towards the end of this month as well. The last summit was in mid-March with Tokyo. It's considered to be a big follow-up. What's the latest? Yeah, so it hasn't been that long, actually, since the last uh, summit. So only a couple of months. Uh, So it obviously goes to show and highlights the kind of efforts that the UN administration is making to try and get these uh, relations with Japan back on track. Uh, And if if Kushida does come uh, to Korea, nothing is confirmed at the moment. Talks are underway, but Mm. it would be the first... Uh, visit to Korea by a Japanese Prime Minister uh, for a bilateral meeting in 12 years. Now, details of the summit between Yoon and Kushida have not been uh, revealed. Um, there are growing expectations that Kushida will make a, a friendly gesture, such as an apology for Japan's occupation and the damage caused during the time, although there's uh, little uh, hope of any uh, outright apology from uh, Kushida, but we'll have to see. Mm. Um, Now, there are also expectations that Japan will announce the ending of restrictions on trade with Korea, uh, including putting Korea back on its list of uh, trusted trading partners. Uh, Korea added Japan, if we remember, uh, Japan back to its whitelist last month. Now, the presidential office did not confirm uh, the date of Kishida's visit. It only said consultations are ongoing over the matter. Now, initially, Kishida was anticipated to visit Seoul around summer, Actually, after the G7 summit uh, in in Hiroshima, slated for May 19th to 21st. Uh, However, the visit seems to be happening sooner than expected, resulting um, from an apparent push from the U.S. for prompt improvements in Seoul-Japan relations. Now, what the two leaders will discuss at the summit and whether they will add anything to a new nuclear accord reached between South Korea and the U.S. last week, the Washington Declaration, as they called it, remain uncertain. Uh, A senior official at Seoul's um, uh, foreign ministry said Seoul has no plans for now uh, to create a trilateral consultative uh, group on extended deterrence with Washington and Tokyo. Uh, So for the moment, it's just between South Korea and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also, the leaders will reportedly meet on the sidelines um, of the G7 summit to boost uh, trilateral cooperation. The three leaders are expected to advance talks on North Korea's Uh, weapons threats, as well as trilateral cooperation on economic security. All right. uh, Staying on the diplomatic front, this is our second key word of the day. Upgraded relations. So more praises are coming out, of course, from the presidential office regarding President Yoon's trip to the U.S. So what were some of the latest comments? Yeah, so the opposition uh, is in China and Russia. They're still not happy with uh, what came out of the trip, but uh, certainly the Top office and senior government officials are certainly hailing the uh, summit as an upgrade in relations. Uh, National Security Advisor uh, Cho Tae-yong said, The alliance between South Korea and the United States has been significantly upgraded from an alliance based on conventional military power to a nuclear deterrence alliance through the Washington Declaration. Uh, It was basically a pledge, uh, if you remember, adopted uh, during the summit to bolster the U.S. extended deterrence commitments. Now, Cho told YTN... Uh, Quote, if bombers, warships and submarines are all put together, we will be working in a situation effectively similar to the constant deployment of strategic assets, unquote. And he added that the goal is to maintain uh, the readiness to deploy strategic assets so as to surely punish North Korea if it plays with fire at any time during the year, uh, Mm -hmm. he said. Now, he noted that the upcoming visit by a nuclear uh, ballistic missile submarine from the U.S. to South Korea is something... Uh, unseen in nearly 40 years. He said this means the U.S. will send all the strategic assets it can to ensure South Korea does not come under a North Korean nuclear attack. 
Uh, and he also took note of uh, Biden's warning that the North Korean regime would end if it used nuclear weapons, saying it was actually the first time for the US president to say such things. Um, Defense Minister Lee jong sub also hails the uh, declaration. He told Mail Business News that the declaration could be called the Allies' Second Mutual Defense Treaty, uh, touching on the nuclear consultative group, uh, the group that was pledged as part of that declaration. Hmm. Uh, he said it laid the foundation for an extended deterrence mechanism under which Seoul and Washington uh, will work together rather than the U.S. unilaterally helping out uh, South Korea. Of course. I mean, there's an entire spectrum when it comes to the uh, prospects of nuclear umbrella. And the more conservative you are, the more, I suppose, uh, a proactive you might want to be with nu- uh, putting, well, nuclearizing South Korea, too. Uh, mm. So, as you've said, I think certain criticisms remain, but that tug of war is the nature of politics. Uh, we'll probably talk about this for the rest of the week. <laughs> That's the latest yeah. on that front. <laughs> I mean, if you remember, uh, the UN administration was uh, at first, anyway, they were adamant at that actually kind of, you know, deploy nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. He then, uh, the president backtracked Mm -hmm. on that. And now it seemed with this Washington declaration that they found some kind of middle ground Mm -hmm. between them Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, nuclear uh, asset deployment to the Korean Peninsula. So, um, yeah, there you have it. They found middle ground. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whether they'll advance more from here remains to be seen, but that is the declaration uh, thus far. All right, let's move on uh, to our economy section. Trade deficit continues in South Korea, and this is our third keyword of the day. Falling exports. So Korea's exports have fallen for a seventh straight month in the month of April for their longest losing streak in three years. Can you tell us the details of the latest report? Right. So uh, this is due primarily to, uh, of course, weak demand for semiconductors, as well as an economic slowdown uh, across the world. Now, with the reduced exports, Korea reported a trade deficit for 14 months in a row as well. Uh, Trade ministry data shows outbound shipments fell just over 14 percent on year to about $49.5 billion last month. Uh, Exports of semiconductors sank 41%, uh, of course, on falling demand and, of course, a drop in chip prices as well. Uh, Fewer working days and a high base effect were also behind the fall. Uh, If you remember April last year, we actually saw a record amount of uh, exports. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, exports have logged uh, on-year fall since October last year amid aggressive monetary uh, tightening by major economies, of course, to uh, curb inflation and uh, an economic slowdown. It's also the first time since 2020 that exports have declined for seven months in a row. Uh, Meanwhile, imports fell just over 13% on year to about $52 billion. Uh, This comes as the country's energy imports went down about 26% on year. Now, Korea depends on imports for most of its energy needs. Um, Now, so those related uh, imports have been uh, slowing down. The country suffered a trade deficit, therefore, of about two and a half billion dollars last month, uh, reporting, as I said, a trade deficit for 14 months in a row. That actually hasn't been seen since uh, 1997 uh, on the onset of the Asian financial crisis. However, if we look at the data, the amount of deficits has actually been improving since the start of the year. Mm. Uh, there has also been a continuing growth in exports of cars and ships as well. That's um, kind of offset, uh, kind of uh, too drastic of a drop in exports. So, so uh, Korean cars and vessels seems to be doing quite well. Now, a reopening of China's economy is also adding to hopes, uh, although quite slim, that exports may start to pick up in the future. Although, of course, when that certain uptick will happen remains to be seen. Mm. We stay with the economy section for our fourth key word of the day. Gloomy outlook. So the chief of the IMF has also warned of continued inflation as urged central banks to keep their monetary tightening. Uh, So no real positive prospects for the time being. Uh, What did the IMF chief have to say? Right. Kristalina Georgieva told an economic forum uh, in the U.S. that inflation isn't going down as much as many had hoped. Uh, She estimated that global inflation will hit around 7 percent this year, way above basically most uh, central banks' targets. She also predicted that uh, this year's global growth will be at 2.8 percent. 
uh, and stay at 3% from next year and the following five years as well at that range. Uh, she noted that a drop in manufacturing was one of the reasons behind the gloomy outlook and expressed regret that there weren't enough measures to prop up the manufacturing sector. She also attributed protectionist policies by certain countries um, in uh, slowing global growth. Now, the IMF last month warned that the turmoil in the banking system will likely be a drag on economic growth as well and that financial markets remained fragile and stressed. Mm. Uh, Georgie Eber says she expects more weaknesses to be exposed in the banking sector. Uh, that remark came only hours after First Republic Bank was rescued by JP Morgan Chase and yet another uh, banking collapse, and she said the quick transition from low to much higher interest rates uh, played a role in uncovering weaknesses at certain banks and added that the pain uh, may not be over. So basically not the end of the banking crises or a series of banks mm. that have collapsed, uh, especially in the U.S., and Credit Suisse as well. So, um, yeah, so that quick transition, of course, is certainly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not uh, doing so, not... Um, uh, doing so well in right. terms of the banking sense. Yeah. So, Kristalina Georgieva was quick to add that the banking industry needs to be watched for additional risks because the vulnerabilities of the financial sector are more evident than ever before. We're kind of seeing a trend, but no two stories are exactly alike. So, that's mm. the latest forecast out of the IMF chief. Uh, do you believe in that saying, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch? Adam. <laughs> uh, uh, I, well, uh, that's been a debate in the Korean society for a while, hasn't it? It, but uh, I mean, any, everyone loves a free anything, don't they? Free lunch. Yes. I remember when I went to school, uh, lunch wasn't free, but uh, mm. yeah. So <laughs> I don't know why I mentioned that. I thought I did have free lunch, but no, it was paid for. But uh, by your parents? I didn't pay for it <laughs> by my parents. So it was free lunch for me, but not for my parents. Yeah. Actually, that's a really good point. But it's a matter of perspective, right? When we're young, for us, we don't have to pay attention to who's paying the bill. Um, yeah. And the, the cliche is only brought up because if something is free, as an adult, we're reminded to question it. Why is it free? Who's paying for it? And yeah. what's the trade off, so to speak? That's a really long segue. Our fifth keyword that's, of the day. <laughs> Free culture. Because I got thinking, is this a good thing yeah. or a bad thing? Because who picks up the yeah. bills also should be asked. There always seems to be some catch, right? Yeah. yeah. Admission fees for 65 Buddhist temples around the country will be scrapped starting this week. In fact, as of Thursday, we'll be able to access some of the more popular uh, Buddhist temples for free. Mm. Can you tell us the details yeah. of the plan first? I don't know how you went from temples to lunch, but uh, <laughs> lunch yes, to temples, so, actually. Or lunch to temples, rather. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, the free, uh, the free admission uh, will begin uh, Thursday uh, when a revised law act requiring the state to make up for the loss of fees uh, comes into force. Uh, this comes after the Cultural Heritage Administration and the Choge Order, which is Korea's largest Buddhist sect, signed an agreement yesterday uh, for the administration to basically cover the costs of temples affiliated with the order in accordance with the law uh, stipulating state funding for cultural assets. Now, under the revised law, state-designated cultural properties can receive funding for the preservation or management of the properties from the government if they do not attempt to recoup the costs through admission fees. Now, this comes as temples, mostly within national parks, continue to charge fees even after fees for national parks were scrapped in 2007. Mm -hmm. Now, the fees range from 1,000 to 5,001 per person, so not that expensive, but it was still um, a bit of a hindrance for people who just simply wanted to go to these national parks and had to pay right. uh, because of these Buddhist temples set up there. And they set off a whole long-term debate between the temples and the national park visitors um, uh, because a lot of these uh, visitors wanted to climb mountains in these national parks as well. And such issues, uh, if, interestingly, if you haven't, was the, what was it, the weird lawyer, Wu uh, mm -hmm. that issue was also... Uh, was touched upon in one of the episodes in that drama on Netflix. So, so for those who haven't watched, that's uh, interesting to catch as well. It's kind of a related issue. Now, the CHA will accept applications uh, from owners or managing organizations of state-designated cultural properties uh, for government grants until the end of June. Now, the revised law on covering the loss of admission fees isn't confined to cultural properties inside Buddhist temples. The government 
will also accept applications of grants from private owners or managers of state-designated cultural properties and review their qualifications for the mm -hmm. government funding. So basically not the uh, Buddhist temple. So if you have to pass through private property, for example, mm -hmm. of course, uh, the, that is a completely different issue that needs to be um, uh, looked into as well. And it also will accept applications for grants on that. Now, mm -hmm. but temples that own or manage cultural properties designated by cities or provinces will uh. actually continue to charge emission fees. So do take note of that. Um, I, it's been a while since I've climbed a mountain and uh, <laughs> gone for a tungsan, as they call it in Korea. So it doesn't really apply to me. But of course, it might be a bit of an annoyance for those who just simply want to visit these parks, but then who aren't really going to the Buddhist temple. So, mm. yeah, that's been this whole debate of where is the final destination if you're passing through. Sure. But, uh, yeah, but there you have it. There so, going to be free from Thursday. So, it's all moot from now on, anyway. <laughs> Actually, it's not moot until Thursday. So, for at least well, 48 yeah, just hours. A few days. Yes. <laughs> Technicality. Exactly. Technicality. Thank you very much, Adam, for today's banter. We appreciate it as always. I'll see you tomorrow. You're very welcome. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.